Hello, friends. Thank you for getting up in the morning. Is it, is it programmers that don't get up before 10, or is it network engineers? I can never tell. Network, network engineers are up at 6 a.m., aren't they? They roll right over and they get on their, their phones. Actually, you can tell what kind of a nerd you are depending on the distance of you to your phone while you're sleeping. Yeah, if, it's, if it's under your pillow, you have a problem. You laugh because you have a problem. Uh, my name is Scott Hanselman, and I'm going to uh, talk to you for a little bit here uh, about some ideas I've got on personal productivity. Let's see if my, there we go, there's me, hi. Uh, you can actually go out and, uh, and Google for me, uh, or I work for Microsoft actually, so Google with Bing uh, for Scott, and I'm on the first page. There's actually an epic battle right now between me and the Scott toilet paper people. So if there's anything you can do to help me out with that, after this talk, you can go and say, hey, I saw Scott, not the toilet paper people. And that will give me more Google juice. So I would very much appreciate that. So I do a bunch of stuff. And by the way, this is a picture of Darth Vader on a cat, just to make sure you're paying attention. It has nothing to do with the talk, but it's awesome. So I've been doing software for a very, very long time. I've been in the industry for 20, 25 years now. I started out doing things in C++ and Pascal. I wrote uh, Palm Pilot applications back in the day in 4K. I've been blogging for 10 years, and I blog about all sorts of stuff. This is a picture of my son and the indicator light that shows when I'm on the phone so that he won't come and bother me. Isn't that a cool idea? Yeah, he totally ignores it anyway, but it's a great idea. It's blinking light. Of course, he's colorblind, so there's a gray light over my door there uh, that, that switches when I'm on the phone. I blog about teaching kids how to program. I blog about square foot gardening for programmers. Looks like that's getting cut off a little bit there, guys, on the top. Hey, audio, video guys, you're cutting me off just about uh, 200 pixels on the top there. They're going to fix that. Uh, I've talked, blogged about things like uh, building an arcade cabinet. This is before and after. Uh, I've written a number of uh, phone applications, and I have a game called Baby Smash uh, for babies. It's not smashing babies, but babies get to smash the keyboard. Babysmash.com, you can check that out. And they, uh, they're going to move the pixels down, you'll see at the top there. I've got a number of books that I'm not very proud of, uh, and then a, a book that I'm working on about uh, being in a mixed marriage where one is a normal person and one is a geek. So managing those uh, mixed marriage situations. So I'm doing a lot of different stuff out there. I've got a podcast called Hansel Minutes. We're going to actually do a podcast with Susie Wee after this talk. I've got a show called This Developer's Life, which is a, a ripoff of This American Life from the developer's perspective that I would encourage you to check out. But about all these different things that I'm doing, even a free video you can get called Get Involved in Tech, where I talk about the importance of being a social developer. This is a two hour long free documentary you can get. I do work for Microsoft, sorry, uh, but I work in open source, which makes it better. And making that transition from open source to work for Microsoft has been a little bit difficult. A number of people have called me a sellout, and it's made me feel really, really sad. And I wasn't really sure how I was going to be able to comfort myself in dealing with this. But somehow, I've been able to work through those issues. Uh, because working for Microsoft, uh, this is me before, and this is me after. So it's pretty awesome. But I do all these different things because it's super fun. I have a lot of fun doing these things. People say, why do you do it? Because I must. I must dance. Now, people ask me, how do you get all these things done? How do you be productive? So they ask for my advice. And it's very frustrating when someone asks for your advice and they don't necessarily take it. Folks over here, feel free to have a seat. These folks are computer people. They can defragment the chairs if you'd like to have a seat. We do understand contiguous free space, and we're more than happy to give you some chairs. And look, random applause for that joke, and it had nothing to do with me. But do, do have a seat. So. Assuming that you guys are not this person, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So the actor Paul Reiser once asked the much more at the time famous actor Peter Falk, how do you write a movie script? Peter Falk, of course, played Columbo. And Peter Falk told Paul Reiser before he wrote Diner, Paul Reiser's breakout movie, you get some paper, you put it in a typewriter, and you type fade in, and you keep typing. And that was Paul, Peter Falk's uh, secret to productivity. 
I don't think it's quite that easy, though, because he was only doing one thing. Right now, we're in an environment where we have to scale ourselves. We have to do a lot more than just one thing. Well, it turns out, I have found, that the less stuff that you do, the more of it you can do. It turns out, if you do nothing, you can do it infinitely. That's a, that's a really great quote, actually. I, I'm going to make that a quote. There we go. So now that's a thing. So you can quote that, and it's, it's famous. For those of you who are maybe uh, you know, in the network engineering space, here is a chart showing you proof that writing to dev null, in fact, does scale infinitely. So if you didn't believe me before, doing nothing, in fact, uh, you can do it forever. Now, there was a time when you could know everything. There was a time when the sum of all knowledge was in a book, and you could read that knowledge and figure that out. But now, you can know nothing. You, you really do know nothing. Your entire life is just filled with 1,000 plus. And every once in a while, you right click and you say, mark all as read, and effectively just declare email bankruptcy. And you die a little bit inside, but you don't tell anyone about your secret shame. Now, back when I was programming in the, in the 80s and 90s, there was basically these two books. That was all there was. And if you wanted some information, it was in one of these two books. And if you didn't have that information, you were basically screwed. You could maybe put that on CompuServe, and then two weeks later, you know, dial back in and see if someone answered. But you were effectively alone with your two books. Today, though, a third of your day is being interrupted. There's more information being made exabytes. I don't even know what an exabyte is. I know it's a lot, though. It's probably a thousand or a million times more than a petabyte. This is basically YouTube. And half the stuff that you're getting is actually useless. And no one's talking about it. No one's having conversations with ourselves about this. No one is deciding that we need to say, I feel like a failure. Actually, if you go out right now and Google for phony, my name will show up on the first page. I'm also pretty proud of that, because I wrote a blog post about imposter syndrome. Everyone feels like a phony. Everyone feels like they're going to somehow get caught, and that their boss or their coworker is going to go, I haven't really seen him in the office lately. He must be just hanging out. And then you're going to get canned. But what you do is you go to work, you show up at 8, you check your email, and then you time travel into after lunch. That occurred immediately when you opened Outlook. There was a, and then it's 2 o'clock. Then you get past your email, and if you're a program manager, you probably just delete email for a living. Remember that deleting email is not a skill, so you need to take that off your resume. Then around 3 o'clock, you know, okay, I'm going to get some coding time in. You start coding, 4.30, 5 o'clock, you really start to get your sense of productivity. But you've got to go home, you've got to put the kids to bed, and you say, OK, tonight I'll just stay up late. Just catch up. It's a busy season, you know, April, May, June time frame. It's a little bit, a little bit busy, and then I'll get past this hump. Stay up till 2 in the morning, work, work, work. Wife's falling asleep, watching Game of Thrones. Husband's falling asleep, watching the Hallmark Channel. You're coding, coding, coding. You wake up and you do it all over again. You rinse and repeat. Because, you know, March, April, May, June, July, kind of August, September, October, November, December time frame is a busy season for you. But you'll get noticed because of all of your hard work, and then somehow it'll be OK. I just need to work late to catch up. But remember that hope is not a strategy. Now, I'm going to parse two different words here. I've given this talk all over the world in multiple languages. So I've got some different languages here. I've done it in Bulgaria. I've done it in Egypt. I've done it in Poland. Because these two words, even though they're English words, are close to each other. The first word is effectiveness. Okay? And effectiveness is doing right things. That means setting a target or a goal and going in that direction. So effectiveness is goal-oriented. The other word is efficiency. The reason that I put these other languages up here when I give these talks in other countries is because in some non-English languages, and if you speak a language, by the way, that's not English, be thinking about this. What are the words for effectiveness and efficiency in your language or the other language you know? Oftentimes, it's the same word. These words are very different, and sometimes we have to tease them apart. So efficiency is not goal-oriented. Process oriented. It's not setting a direction, it's running in that direction. If Usain Bolt is going to win a sprint, he doesn't have to decide in a direction to run, he just has to run in that direction really, really efficiently. Someone else pointed him in that direction. So, phrasing this another way, effectiveness 
is doing the right things while efficiency is doing things right. And we spend so much time trying to be more efficient, trying to run as effectively as we can and fooling ourselves into thinking that multitasking is a feasible thing. Young people love to tell me how they can multitask. I'll tell you later why you can't. You need to be thinking about effectiveness. Let's talk about being effective. Here's an example of being ineffective. Doesn't matter how good of a goalie he is, he picked the wrong direction. So in order to make these decisions, though, you need your tools and the things coming into your life to work for you, like your inbox. And I don't mean your email inbox. I mean the general concept of an inbox, the things that are coming into your life. And those things need to be triaged. And I picked the word triage. It's a very specific word because it's more than just saying acted upon or sorted or sifted. It's a French word, and it, it evokes a sense of uh, toe tags. It evokes a sense of war, right? When you triage something, it's because there's a lot of people on the battlefield, right? Those people on the battlefield are injured. Let's zoom in on the toe tag there. They're either dead or they're in trouble or they need to get off my field of battle or they're wasting my time. But interestingly, in our inboxes, like our email inboxes, a Viagra ad and an email from your team and an email from the CEO of the company are treated as peers in the same system. And you get that pile of physical mail, right? And someone just kind of plops that down and then bills and political ads and uh, important information are peers sitting in this field of battle and no one ever goes and triages that stuff. So I'm going to take a couple of ideas from people like David Allen, people like Stephen Covey, and we're going to try to synthesize those into how we can make the decisions. Now David Allen, from Getting Things Done, you probably read about Getting Things Done, has this idea of the threefold nature of work. There's predefined work, work you set up ahead of time that you need to work through. There's work as it appears, just in time work. And then there's this thing called defining work. When was the last time you set an appointment for yourself to figure out what the hell you're doing next? Like literally, block out an hour. Set your phone to busy and go, what the hell am I doing here? Seriously. You might say, well, I did that last month. Right? You should be doing that every single week because defining works is as important a work as just-in-time work or work that was planned ahead of time. But when these things come into our lives, we don't act on them in a really ruthless way. David Allen recommends this four Ds. Do it. Can you do it in five minutes? Quick phone call, quick email, boom. Do it, do it, do it. Otherwise, you drop it. Dropping stuff is the most effective way to get stuff done. It's really, really difficult. That sounds silly and it's fun to say, but I'm not kidding. Saying no is so significant. It's really difficult because they might find out that you're a phony. But if you say yes, and then you don't do anything well, then you are a phony. But saying to your boss, even if you're new at the company or a junior engineer, you know, I just, I really can't do that. If you want me to be successful at this, then I can't do that. I can give it to you good, fast, or cheap. Pick two. Delegate it. Another thing that we don't do very well. Literally asking someone else to do the work for you, someone that you trust. You have to facilitate and to cultivate those relationships in order to say, you know, I can't do it, but can you do it? Because I know you'll do it well. And then releasing it. The goal here is to get these things off of your head. Get the context switching out of your brain. And then deferring it. Now taking David Allen's ideas and then overlaying it on the Covey quadrants. If you've seen the seven habits, seven habits of highly effective people, there is importance on one axis and then urgency along another axis. Things that are both important and urgent might be something like a pregnant wife or a house is on fire. These are urgent and important things. We need to spend more time over here on important stuff that's not that urgent, meaning not procrastinating. I know that people like to say, especially younger people, I, knew I, I do my best work at 2 a.m. the day it's due. It's total crap. It's complete garbage. You can't do that. That is, that, that is basically saying, you know, I feel most at home when my house is on fire, and then that's when I really feel like I'm using my house to the fullest, when it's completely engulfed in flames. But we spend all this time doing all of these things that are trivia or crises. 
And then we let interruptions turn into crises, and we spend no time preparing. Now, taking these concepts and applying real stuff on top of them, things like the phone have a sense of urgency and a sense of importance. Network's down, something bad's happened, my pager's gone off, or you know, something occurred that's important. Very rarely will you be told that your house is on fire or that the baby is coming via email. So I would propose that most email is not important. And I would guarantee you that Twitter is not important and Facebook is not important and Facebook is not moving your life forward. Now I'm a big social media guy. If you follow me on social media, you know I'm always tweeting about stuff. Hey, I'm on the toilet now, pooping. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm tweeting about it. But that's not moving my life forward. I am conscious when I tweet and when I spend time on social media because I know that for everything that I spend down here, I'm not moving something forward up here. Let's talk about Twitter a little bit. This is a picture of a mouse with an electrical uh, lead directly into the pleasure center of its brain. Okay? And all the mouse has to do is just pull this lever here to refresh this sense of well-being, right? And you know how it will happen. The, the mouse will push that until it eventually dies of apparently pleasure. Just have to pull to refresh. Just, just pull to refresh to get that sense of well-being. Pull to refresh to get a feeling that perhaps things are going to be okay when really it has nothing to do. Has anyone really succeeded in their life or closed on a house or got that big promotion because of pull to refresh? Remember when there was just one set of footprints on the beach? That's when Jesus unfollowed you on Twitter. Because you tweet too much. Take a break. Remember that, as we all know, when it comes to networking, systems that work drop packets. That's how the internet works. When we learned about TCP and we learned about the internals of the network, it works because of drop packets. AT&T is in business even though they cannot hold a phone call for more than five minutes at a time without the and the, but you still understand what they're saying. Sometimes dropping the ball is the right answer. If it's not an important email, don't answer it. They'll, an, they'll call you back. It'll get, it'll get uh, escalated. Don't drop the ball if you're this guy, though. And this is a picture of a guy surfboarding on a crocodile. Just to make sure you're still with me. So we want to get these things off of our heads. We want to get these things out of our stress zone. There's this thing called psychic weight. You guys remember when TiVo came out? Remember Replay TV and the DVR? This was the biggest thing since God talked to Moses. I mean, it was literally like, here, let's get the Ten Commandments. I'm going to go back up the mountain and bring you the TiVo and explain to you that you no longer have to have appointments television. Right? I used to rush home to watch Seinfeld, and now I have like the all Seinfeld channel. I don't even know when Law and Order is on. It's just on always because of TiVo. And I thought, this is a time saver. This is great. I can spend more time with my family. I can focus on what's important. But then TiVo and the DVR turned into psychic weight because it became a to-do. It became a list of stuff to do. Have you had this conversation with your spouse or non-technical, non-gender specific significant other? Okay, um, let's put the kids to bed early tonight, and we're going to bang through all of these episodes of The Wire. We've only got 11 episodes of The Wire to get through. We can do this. We'll stay up from, let's see, about 7 o'clock to 3. We can do that all. We might be able to get a couple of episodes of Lost in, and then that'll be done. Right? Our lives are in chaos, but at least we've got The Wire handled. That's something that can be dropped. The psychic weight of the TiVo holds you down because you're thinking about it. All oh, the space is filled up. I got to delete stuff. If I, if I delete this, she's going to divorce me. I don't want to delete that. You know, I've got this is from last year, but I, I'm, I'm going to watch it one of these days. You know, there's a new Doctor Who, but there's this other old Doctor I haven't watched yet, so I'm going to get to it. Doesn't put you to the next level. Doesn't move you forward. How do you move forward? My friend J.D. Meyer at gettingresults.com, it's a free book that you can get, has this idea of the rule of three. And this is a really great way to decide on what's important. For any one day, don't think about the 50 things that you need to get done. Think about the three things that you could get done. Remember what I said 
before about how you check email in the morning and then you teleport into the afternoon and then you go home feeling like the day sucked, I didn't get a darn thing done, I'll stay up late and it'll be better somehow. You feel that. You don't tell your, you don't tell your neighbors, you don't tell your work buddies that I really don't think I'm cutting it at this company. But you feel it because you didn't get the 40 things done you need to get done today. What are three things that you could get done today where you would actually go home and say, man, I kicked that day's butt. I got those three things done. And then widen your scope. What are three things you could do for the week? Three is a great number because you can focus on it, you can keep it in your head, you don't need a to-do.txt, you don't need a list, you don't need Trello, you don't need Outlook tasks. Just three freaking things that I can do today. And one of them is not opening email. Imagine what it would feel like to go to lunch having finished maybe even two of these things before lunch. That would be epic. Wouldn't that be amazing? Think about a vision of your week. Show up first thing, set an appointment for yourself at 8 or 9 o'clock on Monday and say, what's going to make this week kick butt? What's my vision for an awesome week? Then on your calendar, and I have this on my calendar, I'll show you at 4.30 on Friday, reflect what worked, what didn't, where did I get interrupted, what was a problem, what did I focus on I shouldn't have focused on. Then forgive yourself and then do it again next week. Now some people, our project managers for example, are really, really busy, aren't they? Super busy. I'm so busy, I don't have time to talk to you right now. I'm very, very busy, very important person. Uh, that's a kind of laziness. Being so busy that you can't sit down and have lunch with somebody, that you can't focus on the project. When your scrums, when your daily scrums feel rushed, that's indiscriminate action. That's just being busy for busy's sake. That's one side of things. Another side is when you see people just basically chilling, just hanging out on, on Twitter, on Facebook. Turns out that being creative and making stuff is the opposite of hanging out. I'm always impressed when people say, I'm taking a break from Twitter, and they really do. Because you know I can see y'all tweeting after you said that. I'm getting off of social media. But check out this really cool BuzzFeed quiz. People take a break and then they go underground and they work and they come back out. They put that paper in the typewriter, they type fade in, and then they come back out and say, look what I made. It's a very good feeling. Think about how you're going to thank yourself for that gift of not hanging out. And the way that you do that is by letting other stuff go, stuff that doesn't matter. Someone will always be wrong on the internet. That is the first thing that you can do. If your hobby is arguing with people on the internet, maybe consider a new hobby. Because no one has ever said, man, I was a total flaming uh, racist, and then I argued with this guy on the internet, and he completely changed my life around. And it's, you know, thank goodness that the internet is a place I can go for civilized discourse and you know, the kind of thoughtful discussions that can really only happen in 140 characters over an asynchronous kind of marginally reliable data protocol. Thank you, Twitter, for bringing me to the light. You know, people that suck are going to suck, and it's not your job to bring them to the light. But every time you try to convince someone of something on the internet, you are wasting time. You're not writing the book you wanted to write. You're not doing the startup you're doing on the side. You're not writing that report for your boss. Let it go. It is so powerful. It is so freeing to do that. It gives you, like, how do you have the time, Scott? How do you have 26 hours a day? I don't. I've got three more hours that you're goofing around, and I'm getting stuff done. Now, once you've decided on your direction, once you've decided on the things that you want to do then, how do you run really, really efficiently in that direction? So here's some homework for you, OK? I want you to identify the data streams in your life. They may be physical streams, like a piece of mail that comes, or stuff that's in an inbox. You may be an inbox person. It may be email. It may be your TiVo. It's all of the different things in your life that stress you out. And I want you to sort them, signal to noise. What feeds your spirit? What gives you value? What moves your career forward? What takes those three things that you want to do this year and makes those things possible? And then I want you to draw a line. And this is mine. Yours is going to be different. I'm a community manager at Microsoft, so I spend a lot of time on the phone and on Skype. You might say, the phone, that's so like 2000 and late. That's fine. Don't pick the phone. Sort your own. But then draw a line. You're really stressed out. You're working on something at work. You've got to get this project done. Draw a line. 
I am not going to check personal email. I am not going to read my Google Reader that's now dead. I'm not going to look at Twitter. I'm going to totally forget about TiVo. I'm going to release these things. I'm not going to postpone them. I'm literally going to stop caring about the blacklist. I know James Spader is super cool, but I'm never going to catch up on the blacklist, so I'll just release it into the world. Then I can focus on this. You'll be surprised at how much time you can free up. Now, your list is different. Take your list of stuff and say, what's, what's valuable and what distresses you out? There are services that can remove these things from your life. I know someone who thought that snail mail was the thing that stressed them out the most. I thought it was a weird thing. I don't really dig, you know, I look at snail mail, I rip up the junk mail, and I act on the other stuff. But let's say, for example, snail mail stresses you out. There are things like Earth-class Earth mail. You can actually have all of your mail redirected to a secure location. They'll scan it. They'll send you emails with pictures of your mail, and you can go delete, delete, delete. If that's the thing, yeah, uh, totally stressed me out. Now you're certainly not stressed, right? That's not the thing that stresses me out. You know, gosh, you know, text messages. People always texting me. Oh my goodness. My brother turned off texting. That's a really great way. You don't like iMessage? Turn it off. It's amazing how few people use don't use airplane mode on the ground. You know how, oh, I'm so productive on an airplane. Everyone's always talking about it. I feel so productive on an airplane because I'm disconnected. Gosh, if only I could have that feeling of productivity on land. Airplane mode, turn off the Wi-Fi, boom, instant productivity. That's really how easy it is. Now, there are email rules. Everyone's got a million different rules, and they spend a lot of time sorting their mail. But sorting your mail into folders doesn't do any, any good at all. It feels like work, though. And that's where we got that joke before about how deleting email may be your job. Isn't that funny how the, people, the higher up in the company you go, the more you basically just bleed email for a living. But is a highly cultivated list of filters really the, the, the solution there? You can do these in Outlook, you can do these in Gmail, but I do these. This is my email rule, and this is one rule that matters. I've got a couple more here, but I'm going to tell you one rule that changed everything for me. I have two inboxes. I've got the one for stuff sent directly to me, and I've got one that I'm CC'd on. Don't allow people to give you an action item via CC. You'll teach them about this by not doing it the next time it happens. Oh, sorry, dude, you didn't see it. Didn't see it? Be sure to to me, otherwise I'm not going to do it. Just takes once. Remember, dropping the ball. That's how you do it. I just took a 240 email inbox and turned it down by 66%. Because these are just FYIs. That's work. That simple rule right there means that I only check my CC box a couple of times a week. And it's basically delete, 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 file, delete, delete, file. Now, I'm a community manager, so I work with the public. So I made another run to, to represent my job. Externals, meaning email from people that aren't at my company. Because I'm, again, working with people outside. That email box right there, that inbox, notice that it's empty. Because those are the people that are fundamental to my job. Those are the people that matter to me. So I answer all of those emails. Those can't be dropped. Maybe that's a box for project mail. Maybe that's a box for mails from your boss. I did that too. I made a search box. These are my boss's three up. So my boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss's boss. Anytime they send me something, I get their emails in a bo box called bosses. That way I never miss them. I don't want to take any chances to, oh, I didn't see the boss's mail. But it's a search box. So they still live up here, but I have a view on them down here. And then I have big ass mail because I don't want to run out of space. But inbox and inbox CC change everything. But you may have 1,000 of these now. You may have 10,000 emails. Mark them all. Control A, move them down into a folder called archive, and don't ever look at them again. If this number stresses you out, right click and go properties and decide whether or not you want to show unread mail versus all mail. You can decide those things. But remember that unread mail hasn't been triaged yet. Unread mail hasn't been processed. And the argument of like, well, everything is exactly where I know where it is, is nonsense. Because you can always search that mail. If your inbox has stuff in it, that means your inbox has stuff in it. You haven't done it, dropped it, deferred it, or delegated it. You haven't turned those things into work. They're just sitting there. They are psychic weight, and they are stressing you out.
So here's homework for you. I would propose that you try. This is a tough one, and this is important. Give it a try, because it can't hurt, right? Now, I know I'm being a little preachy here, but if, you're to if it's totally working for you, if you don't go home feeling bad about yourself, if you don't go home feeling guilty or like a phony, if you totally have email on lock, then pardon me for preaching. But try this for a week. Don't check email in the morning. Don't check email till you get back from lunch. You will be twitchy. You will literally go through withdrawal, like Starbucks withdrawal. You're gonna be like, you know, just check email. I check email. I don't even know what did, what did people do before email? If I don't delete email, I don't really have a job. What do you need to do? You sit down and you focus on it. I'll show you how in a second. But remember this though. How do you get more email? Reply to email. You know how you're on a plane and you answer all your email and you've got your inbox empty. We've all had that happen once. Right? And you got like 50 items in your outbox. And then you land. And then it sinks. And then you got like 100 emails in your outbox. What, what the hell just happened? Well, you replied to 50 emails, so that's going to generate 100. You cannot win that. You cannot win. And you teach people how to treat you. We all want to be the next up and comer, so we try to check our email at 2 in the morning on a Sunday. If your kid has ever told you, Daddy, Mommy, put the phone down. We're on vacation. We're at Disneyland. I was just hang on one second. You've taught your boss that answering email at 2 o'clock on a Sunday is totally cool, and they're going to expect it. If you are an independent consultant and you answer email at 2 o'clock on a Sunday, you've taught your clients that you're available and you're ready to work right now at 2 o'clock on a Sunday. Do you want more email? Do you want more depressed feelings? Don't put energy into things you don't want more of. Now, sometimes I do check my email at 2 in the morning. I don't know. Sometimes I do. We all fall off the wagon. But did you know that you can actually tell the email when you want it to leave the Outbox? In Outlook and in Gmail, in Gmail there's a thing called Boomerang. In Outlook you can just go to Options and say, don't send until Monday at 9 a.m. So I might be checking email all weekend, but I'll go and I'll set them to actually go out on Monday at 9. That way I look like I'm actually awake at Monday at 9, which is never going to happen. But it happens within hours that are reasonable hours. And it doesn't make my people who work for me feel bad. Because if you're a boss of a group of people, especially young people, and they see you answering email at 2 in the morning, they assume that that's appropriate. And they assume that that's going to engender healthy relationships. Now here's a really, really scary thought. There are a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. You can go right now, if you want, to KeysLeft, KeysLeft.com. Put in your age, put in how fast you type, and I will tell you how many emails you have left, how many books are going unwritten, how many tweets are left. You're not ever going to get more keystrokes back. And when you see those numbers, you're going to realize that when you send email, you are giving the gift of your keystrokes to people who may not appreciate them. So for example, I don't know you, sir. If you emailed me a question, you'd be like, oh, please send me the code. Oh, my master's degree thesis is tomorrow, and I need uh, you to write my project for me. I don't know. Something you might typically write, right? Hey, random guy on the internet. I don't know you. I don't want to be a jerk. But at the same time, I still don't know you. And even if I did know you, do I really know you 5,000 keystrokes worth? Right? Maybe I, maybe I know you, but I don't like you that much. I don't know. But I want my keystrokes to work. So where can I put them that's not email that will help us both? And the answer is literally anywhere but email. OneNote, SharePoint, freaking CC Mail, I don't know, Lotus Notes, God help you. Anywhere with a URL, a knowledge base, your docs. How many times have you seen people at work do the big reply to all, five or six paragraphs, epic long thing. Wow, dude, you just wrote the freaking docs. And you put them in email where they will die. They will just go off and they'll be sorted into a folder somewhere and no one can see them. And then you're going to get hit by a truck and we've lost all of those keystrokes. So you email me a question and it's an awesome question. I'm going to write a blog post and I'm going to then send you a link to the blog post. And every additional page view. I don't want a blog stop. No one's going to read my blog. I only got 10 visitors. 10 visitors? to that blog post, that's 10 times the keystrokes. I could have just sent it to him, and then it would have just been our little secret. 
But I can go and put it on the internet and it's going to get multiplied thousands and thousands of times. I don't want to write docs. That's no fun. My company's knowledge base sucks. I hate SharePoint. Now, I want to write email and I'll put all the docs in email. And then when I'll just keep some emails around and then I'll copy paste them every time someone has a question. We know these people because we work with these people. Don't be those people. Don't be those people. Make an agreement that you are going to keep all of your email messages to five sentences or less. Anything less than five sentences is a little bit terse, a little bit rude. Anything more, you're writing a book, dude. You're writing a book and it's too much. You can go up here and actually type this in. They've taken over all of Spain. You can say five.sentence.es. And if five is too much, just change it. Do three, any number you want. You can link to it at the bottom of your email and explain why you're doing this. Think about this. Every time you write multiple paragraphs in an email, was that important? Now maybe it is important. Maybe it's a planning meeting with your boss, or maybe it's an email to the president of the company. But chances are it could have been put somewhere where the keystrokes would get multiplied. It's an extremely, extremely useful thing. Now we all have stuff in our life, whether it be digital stuff or physical stuff. Each of those things you want to find a trusted source for. We usually have this with our email. We have Gmail, we have Exchange, we have whatever we're managing our email on. That's a trusted source. So we keep our email there. We don't even think about that. But all the other stuff, our files, our USB cables, those crucial, crucial USB cables that you could need at a moment's notice when someone might want an old USB 1 cable with an A to B. You don't know. It could happen. The house is on fire. We need a USB cable. Hang on. I've got those. For each medium, find a trusted source and put them there. So I have a medium for paper, for bills, for things like that. I have my files in Dropbox. I have a drawer for my gadgets. But remember, do it, drop it, delegate, and defer it. If there's some gadget that I don't need, like USB cables, I release those into the world. I send those to Goodwill. And other people will appreciate them. And then the psychic weight is released. Just take the entire box of gadgets. If you haven't touched something in two years, you're never going to touch it. So get rid of it. You'll be surprised how a uh, freeing that is. But keep these things available. Don't have them buried. Have these different mediums available. I'll talk to you about how to manage paper in a moment. So when you're focused, when you've decided what you're going to work on, you want to schedule work sprints. I think it's funny that the scrum master at your job is usually the one with 10,000 unread emails. They can't get their life together, uh, but they're managing your project. They run the project like a scrum with extreme programming, and we're going to all scrum, but they don't run their life like a scrum. You can do that. You can run your life like a scrum. You can schedule work sprints, just like we talked about putting on your calendar an hour to plan and an hour to reflect as an actual appointment with yourself. Why not do that with work sprints? I'm going to work for the next 90 minutes or the next X number of minutes on something, and I'm going to focus on it. And uh, here is uh, Pee Wee Herman taking some snakes out of a fire just to make sure you're still there. Is there anyone in the audience who does the Pomodoro technique? OK, awesome. A couple people. Not a lot. This is great. So Pomodoro, I think, is Italian for tomato. If it's not, and there's no Italians here, this totally means tomato in Italian. I say with the full strength of my Italian background. Um, what these are is a little tomato timer. It's a little plastic. It's like an egg timer. It looks like a tomato. And you turn it, and it sets for 25 minutes. And this is a technique, you can go on Google for this, that you can download a PDF for free. A Pomodoro is a unit of time. Okay, it's 25 minutes, not a half an hour, not an hour. It's 25 minutes, five minutes at the end to pee. And what you do is you schedule a sprint. And this is another piece of homework for you. Go back and find a project you need to work on. Okay? And work on it for 25 minutes uninterrupted. And again, you will vibrate. You, you will alt-tab over to stuff and not even know that you alt-tab. You'd be like typing in Word and you're doing and boom, you're in Twitter. You're like, tweet, I didn't even know how that happened, but this hand really wants to be on Twitter. When those interruptions occur, whether they are internal interruptions or external interruptions where a phone rings or someone comes in, mark them on a pad, just a little tick. And then at the end of that, you say, all right, well, I had a five internal interruptions. I'm typing, I'm focused, and I'm, I've got to get milk. got to go and record the wire. Those are, those are yourself interrupting yourself. Mark them. 
Then take a break, do another sprint, and see if you can have fewer interruptions. See if you can have fewer. Observe them. Interruptions happen. Accept those interruptions and then schedule them. Oh, do have to get milk. Get milk. Now move right back into your flow. The goal of the Pomodoro is to stay in your flow. That, that, that flow that you get into at 8 in the evening when the kids are down, or 2 in the morning when you're really at your best, or after lunch, that flow is what you want at 9.30 when you get to work, but you don't because you're in your email. Schedule Pomodoros. Internal interruptions suck, but oh, yeah, I just interrupted myself in the middle of my own talk. But I'm really good at it, so it doesn't matter. And there's some uh, toasters from uh, After Dark. External interruptions. The word for these is toast. You know all the little toast that pops up? I'm not sure when Skype became like the official birthday announcer of people I don't know. But I'm like, OK, thanks, person I don't know. You just turned 28. I don't care. Why don't I just take two minutes to turn that off? Every time you are doing something in your flow and you have to go, oh, OK, I just got interrupted. Do you think Usain Bolt is like running and then he's like, oh, toast. That was a crucial thing that I needed to know. Thank goodness I was told that it was that dude's birthday while I was sprinting. Those things are context switches and they slow you down. Turn off any toast at all. In Windows 8, it's really easy. You just go in the corner, you say notifications, and you say notifications, snooze for an hour, snooze for three hours. In Outlook, you should never be notified about new email. You should check email on your own terms. Any notification is evil. Interruptions suck. The thing that we have to accept, though, is that everything that's important will find its way back to you. That's the thing that's so difficult for us as type A people to deal with. If there's another 9-11, someone will probably tell you. If your house burns down, the company goes under, you'll usually be informed. I used to sit there and refresh CNN.com, like after Princess Diana died, because I was like, someone else is going to die. I don't know who's going to die. Sammy Davis Jr. is going to die. And then I realized he'd been dead like 10 years. But he could have died at any minute. And I was just news junkie. Control, control R, control R. And then I realized that those things are going to come back to me. I listen to NPR in the morning, and I don't listen to I don't check any news at all. Because if it's important, they'll tell me, hey, you see what happened today? Gets me involved with my, uh, with my um, folks at, at work. I try to remain in my flow. I want to focus on having my attention captured, really getting that sense of focus. And this is uh, just awesome. So people think that they can solve these problems with multitasking. The worst app on my iPhone is the thing called phone, where you have to speak synchronously with other humans. Oh, gosh, the shame of focusing your attention on one thing and giving someone the gift of your time. What a, what a sad statement this is. In computer science, we know that the optimal number of threads in a system is one. That includes humans. Multitasking is a lie. Here's an example of bad multitasking. So watch this guy right here. Watch the arm. The uh, the word for we have a word for people like this where I come from is organ donor. So if multitasking is a lie, when can we multitask? Well, I like to multitask while working out. So remember what I said before about how TiVo destroyed my life. Well, it did, but I still really like television. So how do I balance the sitting on my butt and doing nothing with all the other things I want to get done? We talked about how I can multiply my keystrokes. That's just literally simple multiplication. How can I multiply my other things? Well, I decided that I would only work out while watching TV, and I would only be watching TV while I was working out. I immediately doubled the number of hours, and I got really fit. I'm sucking it in now, but believe me, there was this fitness there underneath the fat. What I do is I actually I built a treadmill desk. So I can check email, or delete email, really. I can be on the treadmill desk with my Fitbit, and I've got my tablet, and I'm watching Netflix. I'm triple tasking, totally feasible multitasking. Working out, listening to podcasts, 
One time I was really, really, really stressed out. I had a friend read my emails to me while I was driving to Seattle. I had a four hour drive and I tried to figure out how I can use this time. And I had a friend, could you just read me the important emails and then type for me? Sounds totally cheesy. I don't think you want to do it on a regular basis, but it's an example of a reasonable amount of feasible uh, multitasking. Even better would be to switch over to a train situation, a BART, and then do your email on your commute. Try to utilize that idle waiting time. Those are reasonable amounts of multitasking. Multitasking that you can count on. The, I the iPhone has completely changed the way that I poop. I have no idea what we did in there before. And isn't it amazing the innovation that we've seen in hardware design uh, since, the uh, since the introduction of the iPhone. The other thing that we do, and you've all done this, is you have a pile of books on your desk. Some of them may be Cisco certifications. I don't know. You're never going to read them. And what you do, though, is you will take the bottom book occasionally. Maybe every month, ah, I'm going to put that one on the top, because I'm serious about that one. And then you move it, and you basically build a monolith to your own shame and failure on your desk. And it sits there, and you'll be doing your work, you're deleting your email, and you look over and you see the Ruby way. At the, you're like, I'm never going to read the Ruby way, right? Where you see JavaScript, the bad parts, and it's like 1,000 pages. You're like, there's no way. So d delete them, drop them, don't do them. If you're never going to read them, don't cause them to give you guilt on a regular basis. Put a realistic group of what you're going to read this week. Don't set up systems that make you feel bad about yourself. And remember that you're not Robert Scoble. You guys know who Robert Scoble is? He's this famous blogger who reads everything. And he's always talking about how he's reading 1,500 blogs a day. And I was always like, oh, I'm going to read even more blogs. Oh, you can't beat me, Robert Scoble. And then I realized that that's a completely dysfunctional thing to do. And I had all of these blogs that I wanted to read. And I realized that I'm never going to be simultaneously up on the latest pop culture and the latest fitness this and the latest professional practices. So instead, I found my own scopes. I find bloggers that are good at stuff, that have personal dysfunctions and read too much, but then meta blog, they blog about these stuff. So someone else can guide me. And then when I'm given a task, hey, Scott, I need you to learn Python. Internally, I'm going to want to learn everything there is to know about Python to the most trivial. But remember what I said about drawing that line, sort signal to noise. What do I need to know about this? Maybe I'll just draw a line. I'll learn what I need to know about Python, and the rest can be Google. But if I've been told to be the one who teaches Python to the entire company, maybe I'm going to learn everything up to the edge cases or just above the edge cases. Or even better, find someone else who's an expert at these things and let them guide me. Find that person who can tell me what I need to know and what I should know. Find my own Scoble. And then I went through my news feeds, and I just got rid of anything that was noisy remembering that stuff that's important will find its way to me. So I went out there and stopped drinking from the fire hose. I picked a couple of basic blogs, like Boing Boing is a great blog of just fun links, The Verge, Lifehacker. I found teams of people who blog about the things I'm interested in, and I let them curate it. So I went from trying to read thousands of blogs, reading four or five. Now this brings me to tools. You want to be more efficient, you want to be more effective, what are some tools that we can use to make that happen? You want to find the right tools for your job. Now, I'm going to give you some examples. These are just examples. But what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to audit the list of tools you're already using. I'm not saying, hey, go use OneDrive instead of Dropbox, or get a Kindle instead of a Kobo. It doesn't matter. But think about looking at your workflow. You analyze your workflow at work, but very rarely do we turn those perceptions around on ourselves and actually audit our own personal workflow. And remember that you can't cut things out of your life unless you measure them. So one of the first tools that I recommend is a thing called Rescue Time. Rescue Time. It runs in the background, works on a Mac or a PC, and Rescue Time will watch the window that's in front. And it will categorize it as being productive or not productive. And you can decide. Maybe you're a video editor, so that's a productive app. So then video editing websites would be productive. But I'm not a video editor, so I would mark those as being distracting. Here is a chart of very distracting time by hour. So I can see I'm goofing around reading the news here, and I'm in iTunes over here, and I don't know what, I don't know how DVD decryptor got in there, but I'm doing something clearly very productive right there. Here is very productive time by day. 
You see this right here, how that went to being very productive to being not productive at all? This is me having surgery. Uh, I had my appendix burst. And then this is me in Outlook the next day, which was really stupid because I was like drugged and I've got like a laptop on me and I'm answering email, I'm in surgery. And then I'm back to work and I was a very, very stupid thing to do. But I actually got to see the ebb and flow of my productivity just by running this application in the background. You can hide things, you don't have to worry about privacy, you can filter any way that you want, but the idea is that you can mark stuff as being productive or not, and then you're gonna find that your eight or 10 hour day is probably a four or five hour day. And you're probably just messing around. It's gonna be really, really disturbing to find out that you may burn two or three hours a day on Facebook or Twitter. But then you need to decide, maybe I could do my job, not do those things, and get home earlier, pick my kids up. Maybe I don't have to be checking email at night at two in the morning if I stay off of social media or these non-productive things during the day. You want more hours. You always say, how can I have a 26 hour day? I'm gonna give you two or three free hours when you go and find out the things that are wasting time. Now, physical stuff. Remember how we talked about a, a physical medium for, uh, for trusted things, a trusted medium. There's a thing called 43 folders. This is great. You literally get 43 manila folders and you label them one through 31, and then one through 12 for the months. So you've got January through December, that's 12, and then one through 31. And you make a circular buffer of these things. So what is this, like May 21st? So you'd have the 22nd, 23rd, all the way to 20, 31st, then you'd have June, and then you just open up today's papers, you pull them out, you act on them, and then you move the buffer to the back. So you know how you might get like tickets or crews or you know, property taxes or all the different pieces of paper that you need to be automatically made available. They need to come into your attention when it's time. But at the same time, you don't want to think about them. You want to literally release them into the world. Hey, I got property taxes. They're due in September. I take the, pay, the, new, the, uh, the piece of paper that came in the mail and I put it in September and I forget about it. And then when that comes back around, it's going to be there for me. And I have these all in a little tiny thing. I got at Office Depot. It's a little small container. It's fantastic. Literally made paper a thing of the past for me. Now, some people want paper to be part of their lives. So you don't want to have a PDA. You don't want an iPhone. You can have a hipster PDA. Just get a bunch of three by five cards and some of these little clippy deals. Instant iPad, unlimited memory. Uh, makes you look great. Grow a beard and uh, roll your cuffs up on your jeans. Seriously though, syncing to paper is really, really important. That's why people who run the ER diagrams, the big entity relationship database diagrams, like to have plotters and print stuff out. They want more resolution. They want to back up. They want to put stuff on the wall. If you're really, really stressed out, if your life is falling apart and you can't get a handle on what's going on, go get a haircut and then get a bunch of paper and lay it out on the ground and back up and get a sense of what's going on. It might be a schedule, it might be a project, it might be all your user interface stuff, it might be your network diagram. It is so high res, it's almost retina. And you could even go like this if you want to like feel more digital. It's totally, totally possible. But you can really get a sense of the big picture. My wife and I do this every month to get a sense of what do the next couple of months look like. We print out weeks of schedules and we go, okay, now this is our strategy, our plan moving forward as a family and I can see it all there. Sinking to paper, don't be ashamed. Think about things like Evernote. OneNote is now everywhere on iPhone, iPad, on Mac. It's free everywhere. Sinks everywhere. The point here is that it's everywhere. Quick note, boom, iPhone. Go to my PC, it's there. Whether it be OneNote or Evernote, the fact is it's better than a to-do.txt file. Apps like Workflowy for managing large lists of information. Trello is a great Kanban board, free. We manage our workflow, my family. We have like a little mini scrum with the kids. You know, what are the basic stuff that we're doing as a family? Maybe we're saving up for Disneyland or whatever. To do, doing, done. You get to move the, move the cards from place to place. This can be done with post-it notes and a whiteboard. It doesn't have to be electronic. Maybe you have this many tabs open. If you do, you're a horrible person. <laughs> Everyone's like, I have to have eight gigs of RAM on my laptop. Why? Let's really ask ourselves why. Chrome is why. 42 tab, that's a lot of memory. But what's the gesture? What are you intending to do by opening a tab here? The intent is read it later. 
So you're going to give that tab the gift of 100 megs of your RAM so that you might read it later. And you know you're not going to read it later. You're going to just close it, and then you're going to open Chrome one day, and it's going to be like, restore all tabs. You're like, nah, not today. You're never going to read it again. The gesture, read it later, is a significant gesture. It's not bookmark. It's not email it to yourself. It's read it later. So I use a tool like Instapaper or Pocket, and I say read it later. I have a bookmark here. And then here's the part that's going to blow your mind. At the end of the week, Everything that was long form reading, whether it was Twitter or Facebook or stuff that I, that I bumped into, gets sent to me in a personalized book on my Kindle. So then I can spend the weekend reading all of the cool links that were sent me that week. Took all of that complexity and all those open tabs, funneled them down and sent them to me in my own personalized book that I can read at my leisure over the week. Remember those email real rules and filters? Go and make those happen. Look at things like if this, then that for doing workflows. Again, workflow, setting up automated systems for the data that you have in your life. For example, I like Instagram, but I don't trust it. So if I put a new photo in Instagram, then put the file in Dropbox. I can set up all of these different flows. If I star something on Twitter, read it later, then it shows up in my Kindle. Basic, basic workflow. Make sure that you're putting things in the cloud, like Dropbox. And here's the thing, though. This gentleman said, if it's not helping me make money, now I'm going to cross out and make money. You decide what's important. Be close to my family. Get a promotion. Quit my job, whatever. If it's not helping me to blank, it's not improving my life, then it's mental clutter and it's out. That's how you decide what to drop. So here's your homework. Take a picture of this, and then we're done. Go and sort your sources. Think about work sprints like Pomodoro's. Turn off all toast. Really ask yourself about triaging your inbox. And do an audit of your personal toolbox. I think if you do these things, if you put as much effort into improving your own personal productivity as you do to your companies, you will be a happier person. Thank you very, very much. My name is Scott Hanselman. Do follow me on Twitter. And I will tell you on Twitter uh, when I am in the bathroom next. Bye-bye. <laughs>